Hey guys, welcome to Spec Transfer and to Topic 3.6.3. .3. Skeletal muscles are stimulated to contract by nerves and act as effectors from the AQA A Level Biology specification. As always, let's start with a look at our specification. First of all, we need to know that muscles act in antagonistic pairs against an incompressible skeleton. We also need to know the gross and microscopic structure of skeletal muscle, including the ultrastructure of a myofibril. Then we need to know the roles of actin, myosin, calcium ions and ATP in myofibril contraction. We also need to know the roles of calcium ions and tropomyosin in the cycle of actinomyosin bridge formation. Note that knowledge about the role of troponin is not required. We also need to know the roles of ATP and phosphocreatine in muscle contraction. And finally, we need to know the structure, location and general properties of slow and fast skeletal muscle fibres. So let's make a start. In the body there are three types of muscle. There is smooth muscle, cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle. And this part of the specification focuses on skeletal muscle. Note that skeletal muscles act in antagonistic pairs, meaning that they work together to move bones. When one contracts, the other relaxes. Skeletal muscles work against an incompressible skeleton, so the bones act as levers for muscles to pull against. So the specification wants us to know the gross and microscopic structure of skeletal muscle, as well as the ultrastructure of a myofibril. Note that ultrastructure refers to a very small structure, which can usually only be seen using a very powerful microscope, such as an electron microscope. So on the gross scale, we have the muscle, which is made up of long cells called muscle fibers. If we zoom into a single muscle fiber cell, within the cell we have long organelles called myofibrils. The cytoplasm of a muscle fiber cell is known as the sarcoplasm. We have a cell membrane called the sarcolemma, which has many invaginations, i.e. folds, called T-tubules, which help spread electrical impulses throughout the sarcoplasm and fibre. Muscle fibre cells contain specialised sarcoplasmic reticulum that stores calcium ions needed for contraction. They also contain many mitochondria. Muscle fibre cells are multinucleate, i.e. they contain more than one nucleus, as they are formed from the fusion of multiple cells. So let's zoom into the structure of a myofibril. Myofibrils contain bundles of thick and thin myofilaments that move past each other to make muscles contract. There are two types of myofilaments, myosin and actin, both of which are proteins. Myosin is a thick myofilament and actin is a thin myofilament. Under a microscope, myosin appears darker and actin appears lighter. The structure of a myofibril can be split into different sections. We have something known as a sarcomere, which is a single contractile unit. The Z line marks the end of the sarcomere. Within one sarcomere, we have the A band, which is the length of myosin. We have the I band, which contains actin only. Note that because sarcomeres run end to end, the I band will extend beyond the Z line. The M line is the middle of the myosin. And finally, we have the H zone, which contains myosin only. So how do myofibrils contract? This is possible because myosin and actin myofilaments slide over each other to make sarcomeres contract. Note that myofilaments themselves do not contract. The simultaneous contraction of sarcomeres allows myofibrils and muscles to contract. The sarcomeres return to their original length as the muscle relaxes. In a contraction, the I band gets shorter, the H zone gets shorter, the sarcomere gets shorter, and the A band stays the same. So how does the gross muscle contraction therefore occur? Note that when the muscle is resting, we have something called tropomyosin that blocks the myosin head from binding to the actin myosin binding site. This means that the myosin head can't bind, meaning that myofilaments can't slide past each other. But what happens when a muscle contracts? First of all, an action potential reaches the neuromuscular junction. Acetylcholine diffuses over to the postsynaptic membrane and binds to receptors, leading to depolarization of the sarcolemma. A wave of depolarization spreads along the T-tubules and sarcoplasmic reticulum. This causes the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium ions into the sarcoplasm. Next, calcium ions bind to a protein called troponin, which is bound to tropomyosin, causing it to change shape, hereby pulling tropomyosin out of the actin-myosin binding site. 
Note that the specification says we do not need to know about troponin. However, I've just included it here in the notes as I found it useful in understanding how tropomyosin leaves the actin myosin binding site in the first place. The myosin head is now able to bind to the actin myosin binding site, forming an actinomyosin bridge. Calcium ions also activate ATP hydrolase, which hydrolyzes an ATP that is bound to the myosin head. The energy released causes the myosin head to bend, pulling the actin filament. Another ATP attaches to the myosin head and is hydrolyzed, providing energy to break the actinomyosin bridge. The myosin head then binds to a different actin myosin binding site further along. This process is now repeated. Many actinomyosin bridges form and break rapidly, pulling the actin filament along. Hereby, the muscle contracts and continues to contract as long as calcium ions are present. Next, we need to know about the roles of ATP and phosphocreatine in muscle contraction. So, there are different ways of generating ATP. Aerobic respiration is good for long periods of low-intensity exercise. Anaerobic respiration is good for short periods of high-intensity exercise, when not enough oxygen is available. However, in anaerobic respiration, lactate builds up which may result in muscle fatigue. Finally, we also have something which is called the ATP phosphocreatine system. Phosphocreatine, by the way, can be shortened to PCR with a capital C. Phosphocreatine is stored inside cells. It can phosphorylate ADP, adenosine diphosphate, to form ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and creatine. As you can see, this is a way of producing ATP, which can then be hydrolyzed to release energy within cells for example, for muscle contraction. However, only little phosphocreatine is available, so the ATP phosphocreatine system is only useful for short bursts of vigorous exercise. Finally, we need to know about fast and slow skeletal muscle fibers. As it says in their names, slow skeletal muscle fibers contract slowly and fast ones contract fast. Slow skeletal muscle fibers can work for a long time without getting tired, whereas fast ones get tired quickly. Slow skeletal muscle fibers are useful for long periods of low intensity exercise, whereas fast skeletal muscle fibers are useful for short periods of hard exercise. Slow skeletal muscle fibers use aerobic respiration to generate ATP, whereas fast ones use anaerobic respiration. Slow skeletal muscle fibers are thin in diameter and red in color due to mitochondria, blood capillaries and the presence of myoglobin. Fast skeletal muscle fibers, on the other hand, are thick in diameter and pale in color. Slow skeletal muscle fibers are more widespread and they're found in the postural muscles such as the back. Fast skeletal muscle fibers are found in places such as the arms and legs. Great, that would be skeletal muscles covered. We've covered how muscles act in antagonistic pairs against an incompressible skeleton. We've also covered the gross and microscopic structure of skeletal muscle, as well as the ultrastructure of a myofibril. We have also covered the roles of actin, myosin, calcium ions and ATP in myofibril contraction, as well as the roles of calcium ions and tropomyosin in the cycle of actinomyosin bridge formation. We've also covered the roles of ATP and phosphocreatine in muscle contraction, as well as the structure, location and general properties of slow and fast skeletal muscle fibers. That would be it for now guys. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, comment. Next time we will be covering the principles of homeostasis and negative feedback.